Hi, um, my name is Danica Cooley and I am from Thinking Kids Press. We are here to equip you to um, study the Bible, teach the Bible to your kids, and also to teach Christian history to your kids. Today we're going to talk about reading through the Bible with your kids, um, why you want to, um, why it will help your kids, and how you can do that, and then some tools that will help you. So we're going to start with a story because the Bible is a great big story and God has given us the Bible with this overarching theme of um, salvation in God, in Christ, and his grace and mercy for us. So um, we're going to talk about Jonah, the son of Amittai. Um, and we're going to talk about how the story of Jonah is normally presented. And also, um, how if you are reading through the Bible with your kids, they're going to learn um, something a little different than what they would normally hear in um, a storybook Bible or maybe in um, a church presentation of Jonah in Sunday school. So God said to Jonah, who's a prophet, he said, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. Um, for their evil has come up against me. So basically God says to Jonah, look, I'm going to destroy Nineveh. Go tell them to repent. And Jonah immediately, he flees to Tarshish uh, from Joppa. So he gets on a boat and he pays the sailors and he takes off. And it says twice in scripture that Jonah is fleeing the presence of the Lord. So God um, sends this huge storm and the ship is um is gonna break apart um it's a giant storm and the sailors and i live in a fishing town sailors are not normally terrified people but these sailors are terrified of this storm and they're pagan so they all decide that they're going to pray individually to their different regional gods that they have made up and they pray and ask for mercy um, and it doesn't happen. The storm continues. So they start chucking things over the side. They're throwing out cargo. They go down into the hold, into the hull of the boat, and they're going to pull stuff out and throw it overboard. And um, they find Jonah in the hull of this boat, and he is asleep. And he is asleep, asleep. So they wake him up, and they go, what is wrong with you? Pray to your God that he will protect us. Um and pray for mercy. And Jonah knows what he's done. And even in the midst of this great storm where the sailors are terrified and they're telling him to pray, he does not repent. Um, to repent is to turn from our sin and ask God for mercy and uh, commit to follow him. And he does not do that. So the sailors cast lots, which is kind of like throwing dice, um, to find out whose fault this storm was because they are convinced this is not a normal storm. Somebody is responsible for this. And the lots fall on Jonah. And Jonah knows it's his fault and he still does not repent. So the sailors have 20 questions for Jonah and they ask him all about himself. Who are you? Who is your God? Why are you, what did you do? Like what, what, <laughs> why is this happening to us? So Jonah says, I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So now the sailors know that this guy follows a God who created earth. And they are terrified. Um, and he had told them that he was fleeing God. And they were like, this is a horrible idea. What have you done? Um, and what should we do with you? And Jonah still does not repent. Um, so he says, throw me into the sea and, um, they're like, no way. We're not throwing this servant of the God who created heaven and earth into the sea. So they try to row back to land and the storm gets worse and Jonah still does not repent. So, um, the sailors in desperation, they ask God for forgiveness for throwing this man overboard and killing him. Um, and this storm stops. They throw them overboard and the storm stops. Um, and when that happened, 
the sailors repented, sacrificed to God. So they repent, they follow God, and they're saved. Um, so the sailors are saved, and Jonah, who will not repent, and is a servant of the living God, is in the sea. Um, so God appoints, and, and the Bible in the book of Jonah uses the word appoints a lot. He appoints a great fish. And in the Hebrew, this fish, we always say whale, but, um, and it could have been like a sperm whale or something big enough to swallow Jonah, but it means a great sea beast. So this sea monster swallows Jonah and, um, my kids loved that, that there was a sea monster. Um, so Jonah is in the belly of this beast for three days and three nights. And, um, he does not repent. And if you think about it, like he's in the process of being digested, it had to be pretty painful and horrible. And so finally he repents. And so finally, Jonah thanks God for saving him. He doesn't like come out and say, you know, I was wrong. <laughs> I should have followed you. He, he thanks God for saving him. And um, he doesn't pray for the salvation or safety of the sailors. He just says, you know, I know that you saved me. And um, he, he kind of puts down these pagan sailors in his prayer saying, those uh, who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. So he has a lot of pride in his um, heritage as an Israelite. And, um, and he was wrong because the sailors did, they did repent and they were saved. Um, and then he vows to sacrifice to God, which would be, you know, to go and do what God had said. And he states, salvation belongs to the Lord. And I love that line. So um, we can we can remember that when we pray for our kids, that salvation belongs to the Lord. Okay, so God speaks to the fish and um, it vomits Jonah onto dry land. So, so far, this story is mostly what you would um, hear as a child, right? So God tells Jonah again to go to Nineveh and give them the message that God gives to Jonah. Um, it says in the Bible a lot that Jonah is it that um, sorry Nineveh is an exceedingly great city. It's a, it's a great big city. So it takes Jonah three days to walk across Nineveh and give the message that God gives him, which is yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So essentially, you guys are a bunch of horrible sinners and God is gonna destroy your city in 40 days. And that is the message. And as people hear this message, all of them, all of them believe God. So. They put on sackcloth and they fasted, which is, um, it was a sign of outward repentance. It was sorrow over their sin. Um, so the king of Nineveh hears this. And again, Nineveh is a big city, but the king hears it from his throne. He gets off his throne, takes off his robes, puts on sackcloth, and sits in the middle of ashes and sends out a decree to all of Nineveh. And he says, it's not enough, you know, for just us to put on sackcloth and ashes and repent. We have to fast. So nobody eats any food or water and it's not enough for that. Put sackcloth on your cattle, on all the animals and they don't eat either. So now you have the cows of Nineveh wearing sackcloth and fasting um, and everyone is ordered to cry out to God and um, and he says, let all turn from their evil and violence. Um, and they're just hoping, they're praying that God will show mercy to them. Um, and they know that they're not good people. Um, but they've realized that they have angered a just and holy God and they want salvation. So this is what they're doing. Even the cattle are crying out for mercy <laughs> or they're dressed in sackcloth. They may not be crying out for mercy. So God sees their repentance. Um, and he does relent of this disaster that he is appointed for Nineveh and he shows mercy. And these people are saved. Um, 
because we know that when we call out, we believe in God and, and right, you know, now after the coming of Jesus as fully God and fully man and his, um, his crucifixion and then his resurrection from the dead, if we believe in Jesus and call on his name and confess him before, before people and we repent, we're saved, right? So before Jesus came, if people believed on this holy God, the, the one true living God um, who had promised a Messiah and they believed on him and confessed him and repented, they were saved. So, so Nineveh, all of Nineveh is saved. And this is where most like Bible storybooks end um, and most focus on a moral, which usually is obey God. Sometimes they talk about how you can't outrun God, right? Um, both of those things are true, but it's not the point of Nineveh. So, or uh, the story of Nineveh and Jonah, sorry. So the book of Jonah continues on um, to chapter four, which most kids don't ever even hear this if they don't read through the Bible. So Jonah is just hopping mad. He is so mad. He can barely stand himself. So he prays and says, and I have to read this because it's kind of funny. He says, oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. Uh, and then he says, for I knew you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and re uh, relenting from disaster. So he is telling God off for being a gracious and merciful God. And he's mad. And, um, and he, he wanted Nineveh to be destroyed. So, um, then he asks God to kill him. He's just, he says, it'd be better for me to die than to live. And God asks him, do you do well to be angry? Like, uh, Jonah, is this really what you're supposed to be feeling right now? And Jonah doesn't answer him. He just storms out of the city, goes to the east where he can overlook Nineveh and builds himself this pitiful little booth, which apparently doesn't give him any shade from the sun because God appoints, again, he appoints a plant to grow up over Jonah and shade him. And Jonah is thankful for the plant. He loves the plant, <laughs> not the people of Nineveh, but he loves the plant. So God, um, right before dawn, the very next day, appoints again, a worm to eat the plant and it withers. And, um, Jonah is out in his pitiful little booth that he built and the sun is beating down on him and God appoints um, an east wind to come and Jonah's just scorched at this point and he's probably dehydrated. It says he is faint um, is what the scripture says. So um, Jonah is still mad and he asks again to die and he says, it is better for me to die than to live and so God asks him again, he says, do you do well to be angry for the plant? Like, you know, Jonah, you have compassion for the plant. <laughs> and Jonah says, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Like Jonah is really mad. And this is how he's talking to God. And so God turns to Jonah or he says to Jonah, oh, not that he turns to Jonah. He says to Jonah, you pity the plant for which you did not labor nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left. So they don't know the one true God and also much cattle. So at the end, he throws in that also much cattle. And Jonah cares about the plant. He doesn't care about the people of Nineveh. Can he at least care about the cows? Um, yes, I love um, the parts of scripture where God speaks. And I think that my gift of sarcasm is justified sometimes because God can be a little sarcastic. Um, okay, so the story of Jonah um, is usually just told through the first three chapters. And it's usually, it can be told as a standalone story. Um, it's a great story. I just told it as a standalone story. Um, but it's really a part of the arc 
of um, God's great story of redemption. So when we read it out of context, um, without considering the whole of scripture, um, and even when we truncate it to have it share a moral, um, we can miss the point because God's word is not Aesop's fables. Um, so when we consistently teach the Bible in that way, um, we risk moralizing the stories and making them about us instead of about God and his plan for salvation. Um, when we teach the Bible that way, we are removing the context of scripture um, for our kids. So leaving our kids, um, it often leaves, excuse me, it often leaves our kids with more questions than answers, and they may not know how to vocalize those questions, but they get embedded in their understanding of scripture, and then later it may need to be corrected. Um, so those can be like uh, applying to the story of Jonah. Um, some of those questions could be like, why did Jonah run from God? And did the sailors get saved because in in the story it's just a sentence and in a lot of kids stories it's not even addressed so how were the people saved before Jesus was born um who were the Ninevites and why don't we like them why was God mad at them why did Jonah hate them so much um and why did God command or appoint Jonah the ocean the sea creature um, the plant, the worm, the wind, like what's going on there? And was it really a whale? But that's just kind of fun trivia. Kids love trivia. Like they love to know that in the Hebrew, this was a great sea beast. It was a sea monster. So when we read through the Bible with our kids cover to cover, and you can start in the New Testament and read through and then cycle back through. Um, some people have covered the stories with their kids um, in the books of history and the law and they want to start in the books of poetry and prophecy, that's fine, but just keep going and, and cycle around. So uh, when we read through the Bible with our kids, um, a lot of these questions are answered. So here's some things that if you're reading through the Bible with your kids, um, they're going to find out about Jonah before they ever get to the book of Jonah. So Jonah lived during the reign of Jeroboam II of Israel. Um, this is after um, the United Kingdom of Israel has split because um, Judah and Israel were united under David and Solomon. And then when Rehoboam um, became king, who was Solomon's son, the kingdom split into Israel and Judah. And that was because of their sin of, um, under Solomon. So um, Jeroboam II reigned from 782 to 753 BC, and you can find his story in 2 Kings 14, 23 through 28. Um, he was an evil king. <laughs> he was really bad. Um, but there were Israelites at that time that were crying out to God, and God spared Israel at that point by sending Jonah, his prophet, to talk to Jeroboam and tell him to restore the borders um, of the northern kingdom of Israel uh, from Labo Hamath to the Sea of Arabah. And those are the borders that were um, essentially in place of, during the time of David and Solomon. And um, so that doing that spared them from the attacks that they were suffering uh, under from um, the Arameans. So Jonah saw God's compassion to his people, um, even under an evil king. And Jonah was convinced that God's compassion was only for his people. Um, so Nineveh was a great city in the Assyrian empire. And God used the Assyrians to drive back the Arameans. Um, and and uh, who were plaguing Israel at the time. So the Assyrians were at a time of war. They were also suffering under a great famine. And um, they had these localized regional um, revolts going on. 
they were a lot like the Babylonians. And um, my pastor um, calls the Babylonians an army of psychopaths. <laughs> the Assyrians um, and Nineveh was like their their big city. The Assyrians were bad people. They did bad things um, just because they could. They were just depraved and they worshiped idols and um, did not care about human life. So um, God still appointed Assyria. He used the Assyrians to overthrow Israel in 722 BC. And that's about 30 to 60 years after um, Jonah went to talk to um, Jeroboam and tell him that God said to expand the borders of Israel. So at this point, Israel will not follow God. They won't repent. They've been sent multiple messages. So Assyria comes in and lays them out, but they're cruel and they overdo it and they hurt the people of God. And so two books later in Nahum, God sends a message about the destruction of Nineveh. And so he judges Nineveh. And um, they, at that time, they repented in the book of Jonah, but by the time of Nahum, which is just two weeks later, um, the Ninevites have fallen back into violence. Um, they are robbing people. They are depraved. And this is about two kings later when um, it's, it's two kings later in Assyria when Assyria overtakes Israel. Um, and I'm not sure, I should have looked it up, but I'm not sure when Nahum is written. So the point, the point of the book of Jonah is not that if we run from God, he can find us or that we must obey God. Now these are both true things. These are both things that um, make sense to us, right? But the point is that God is just and compassionate and full of grace and mercy. And he will save anyone who turns to him, believes on Christ, confesses him with his mouth and repents from sin. So um, Jonah did not want the evil Assyrians to be saved. He wanted them to be destroyed. Um, but God is sovereign over all things, peoples and history. And that is clear throughout the Old Testament. So if you've been reading through the scripture with your kids, um, they're going to already know and understand that instinctively just from the story of scripture. It is so obvious that God is sovereign over all things. Um, and the scripture implicitly and explicitly states that over and over again. So Jonah wanted to mete out his own justice. He thought if he ran away, the Assyrians would be destroyed. Israel would be saved. He would have saved history. Um, but God always has a plan. Um, so when you go, then if you're reading through the Bible with your kids, you're going to encounter Jonah again. Jonah shows up a number of times. So I'm just going to read this to you. This is the ESV. Um, so Jesus is talking to the scribes and Pharisees. And they're always trying to catch him in something. Um, and they say, um, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you, like prove to us who you are. And he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Um, the men of Nineveh will rise up in, at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, but be, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So Jesus is saying, you know, you're in the presence of the Son of God, God the Son, and I'm telling you to repent. Um, and these guys just heard Jonah walking through town telling him they had 40 days until their city was destroyed and they repented. Even their cows were dressed in sackcloth. Um, so you, as you, your kids, now this is, I'm just taking Jonah as an example, but as your kids read through scripture with you, they're going to catch that great overarching theme of God's plan for salvation 
they're going to see cross references um, because the Bible is a story and God has written it as a story and used the people of Israel kind of as, as a character in this story to illustrate his plan for salvation. So as you read through the Bible with your kids, they're going to understand God's great plan for salvation, God's sovereignty, um, the major themes of the Bible, like man's sin and um, fall, and then God's plan for salvation, um, who God is, and Jesus' commands for his followers. So um, you can do this. You want to teach the Bible, and you can. As parents, we deeply desire to do what's best for our kids. We look for the best schools or we homeschool our kids. We make sure that they have good food to eat, that they exercise, and we enroll them in extracurricular activities. We take our job seriously. But do we invest time and energy into teaching the Bible to our kids? Giving your kids the life giving and soul nourishing word of scripture is doable and it's an essential part of parenting for Jesus. And the good news is it doesn't have to be hard. Second Timothy 2.15 says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. As Christian parents, our job as people who love Jesus is to help our kids become approved workers, unashamed and rightly handling the word of truth. Teaching the Bible to our kids doesn't have to be hard. In fact, we can study the Bible together as a family. I'm Danica Cooley and my book with Bethany House, Help Your Kids Learn and Love the Bible, will help equip you and give you the tools and confidence you need to study the Bible as a family. It will help you identify and overcome your fears and objections, give you a crash course in what the Bible is all about and how to teach it, and provide you with the guidance you need to set up a family Bible study habit. You will finish this book feeling encouraged and empowered to initiate and strengthen your child's relationship with the Lord through his word. Learn more about Help Your Kids Learn and Love the Bible and grab your free 130-page Family Bible Study Toolkit at lovethebibleforkids.com.